News in America this morning. Have a fantastic weekend. It's Friday, February 3rd. Should we be worried or is this just a lot of hot air? We start here. The U.S. military says it's tracking a Chinese surveillance balloon high over Montana. The question is, where was it flying? The Pentagon's been watching this longer than we thought, and they're not deflating any fears. Republicans kick a Democratic lawmaker off her committee. I assure you this is no political game. Do they have a legitimate grievance, or are they playing squad? And they were ready to offer a Ukrainian orphan a home, then the Russians kidnapped her. This is over. <laughs> You know, we're never going to see her again. Inside the race to help children escape after being stolen as spoils of war. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. Earlier this week, if you were reading the Billings Gazette in Billings, Montana, you would have seen a small headline pop up. Flights grounded in Billings, it said. As the biggest city in the state, population 117,000, Billings has an active airport. But suddenly, flights were halted. It wasn't local Billings officials who made this call. It was the federal government. Well, yesterday, a senior defense official tipped off ABC News why that was. It was because they'd found something. What appeared to be a balloon built for surveillance hovering high high up in the air. That balloon, the official said, belonged to the Chinese. Let's go to ABC's Louis Martinez, who's at the Pentagon. Louis, I know you talk about, like, fighter jets all the time. What do you know about spy balloons? Is that what this is? Brad, spy balloons are tricks of the trade. And here, in this case, it's about something we're not really familiar with, which is that spy balloons apparently cross the United States every now and then, and in this case, from China. The United States government has detected and is tracking a high-altitude surveillance balloon that is over the continental United States right now. The U.S. government, to include NORAD, continues to track and monitor it closely. It's been moving, as you say, very slowly over Montana, which is why it drew attention for that ground stop, and which is why NORAD essentially sent up F-22s to figure out what's going on. President Biden conferred with his national security team and asked for military options. They determined that it was not appropriate to shoot down this balloon because of the risk it posed to civilians on the ground, and that's why President Biden followed that advice. But it's still moving from west to east across the United States. The United States has been tracking it all this time as it moved across. And uh, you can bet that there are going to be additional meetings held as to exactly what to do in the future. I mean, but it, would this be a balloon that's surveilling people, infrastructure, military installations? Like, wh wh why was it over Montana? That's a good question, Brad. What we do know is that this balloon is as long as three school buses, that it has a large technology bay that carries surveillance equipment. Wow. Um, and the question is, where was it flying? It's, we're told by senior defense officials that these balloons um, fly every now and then across the continental United States, but they move very quickly. What makes it, this case stand out more is that we are talking about something that is moving very slowly, and the question mm. is why. And that's why it rose all the way up to the level of the president. Wait, and so... Why not shoot it down, Louis, then? Like, if we're still not sure, like, what this thing was looking at, why take that? Like, also, I imagine somebody with their gun in Montana is going to come out and, like, try to shoot the thing down themselves. Why not? Well, that's a really good question, too, because we don't know how high up it actually is. Uh, officials here at the Pentagon are not telling us, um, but what they were concerned about— Wait, we don't know how high it is right now at this moment? Well, you and I as civilians don't know that, Brad, okay. but the Pentagon surely does. They just don't want to tell us. But what they are saying is that it doesn't pose a risk to civilian aviation. It doesn't pose a risk to civilians on the ground. And that's one of the reasons why they decided not to shoot it down, because if they had, it would cause a, it would create a debris field and it was unclear where it might land. And so that would pose a risk to civilians on the ground. So in order to not create a further situation, that's why President Biden accepted the military's recommendation not to shoot down this balloon. Can you tell me how fraught this actually is? Because on one hand, it almost sounds like a joke, right? Like a, it's a balloon. They generally can't be steered. On the other hand, we're hearing from a senior U.S. official that this is a specially designed military balloon. It's not just drifting. It's got a path and that this is just overall far more provocative than what we're used to seeing with China. I mean, where does this fit into our broader military relationship? 
Oh, it definitely fits into the broader conversation because uh, the United States and China, very tense relations right now, especially in the South China Sea. Um, what are their intentions? What are their ambitions in the Western Pacific? Now you've got this uh, situation where a balloon is hovering over Montana, at, as, as far as we know. And you can really see that the United States has really been focusing on China and how it's going to deter China. Are they thinking about moving into Taiwan? That's definitely a concern. Are they thinking about moving broader into other islands in the South China Sea? That's also a concern. That's why you're seeing Secretary Austin in the Philippines this week. America's commitment to the defense of the Philippines is ironclad. Announcing a new deal where essentially the Philippines will allow more U.S. troops to visit more Philippines bases. And they're doing this jointly because they're concerned about what's going on with China. Ahead of Antony Blinken and uh, meeting with President Xi next week. All right. Louis Martinez at the Pentagon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. When Republicans took the House and not the Senate last November, it was seen as a failure. With just one chamber of Congress, you can't pass a law, you can't push through your agenda. You know what you can do, though? Investigate people. The American people are ready for a majority that will offer a new direction. On election night, I remember analysts on both sides of the aisle telling me, just you wait, every political revenge dream Republicans have had for two years, it's all on the table starting January 1st. Hearings about the border, investigations into the president's family, all these congressional committees that kicked off Republicans for being election deniers will get ready for payback. Now, this week, almost all at once, several of those maneuvers have all sprung into action. Some have decried this effort as a political game. Mr. Speaker, I assure you this is no political game. And yesterday, this accumulated in a Democratic lawmaker, an immigrant who fled to this country and then rose to the rank of Congresswoman, getting tossed from the Foreign Relations Committee. ABC's political director Rick Klein joins us from Washington. And Rick, this is Ilhan Omar, member of the squad, one of these young progressives. Why was she kicked off her committee? In a word, Brad, it's payback. In some ways, this is exactly what Republicans said they would do if they won the House. Uh, they have cited and long cited a uh, history of, uh, of, of remarks that some view as anti-Semitic, uh, certainly anti-Israel. Crimes committed by both the Israeli security forces and Hamas. Representative Omar suggested that the Jewish people and the American Israel Public Affairs Committee were buying political support, writing on Twitter, it's all about the Benjamins, baby clearly amplifying an anti-Semitic stereotype about the Jewish people and money. Some of those remarks she has apologized for in the past, but in the view of Republicans, uh, this was essentially a fireable offense, mm. the kind of thing that you take so seriously that you would take the extraordinary step of going to the House floor and, and voting to remove her from the committee. When a member of Congress makes hateful and anti-Semitic remarks, they're amplified, they are magnified. Even more so when that member sits on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. From the Republican perspective, this is a turnabout as fair play. This is something that Democrats did to a number of Republicans, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, Congressman Paul Gosar, in the last Congress when they were in charge, uh, citing uh, some support for conspiracy theorists, including uh, the big lie, uh, and, and even inciting people to further potential violence in their view. Uh, and this is a power that the majority has. We were right in our action, and she can serve on other committees. But it puts America in jeopardy, and I'm not going to do that under my watch. This was a little bit closer uh, and, and harder fought than Kevin McCarthy thought, but ultimately he was able to convince most, just about all, of his Republican colleagues that this was the right step to take and the right statement to make. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to figure out how precedented or unprecedented this is, right? Because like you said, there have been Republicans kicked out of committees. But is it comparable for like statements that you've apologized for years before this Congress began and currently supporting the pretext for January 6th. Like what, what makes you not fit to essentially do your job for your constituents and the committees you were assigned? Yeah, I mean, look, this is this is tit for tat, despite what Republicans are saying right now. And it's not to say that they don't have legitimate reasons to be concerned about her statements. A refugee and a survivor of war, she knows firsthand how much is at stake in its work. It is too serious of a subject to be subjected to partisan games by the Republican majority. The flip side of that is this is one of the more remarkable uh, uh, stories of anyone who's ever served in Congress, a woman who was a, a refugee from Somalia 
a, mm. a Muslim American woman, black woman serving in the United States Congress, now reelected to Congress, her constituents knowing full well what, what her statements were, are, what her views were. And the view of many Democrats, uh, this is anti-American in its own way. Representative Omar has apologized, learned, and been a reliable and productive member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. To take someone who's a duly elected member of Congress, take some older tweets and statements that uh, some of which she's apologized for, and, and then use that as a pretext to, to, to kick her mm. off. Someone who also happens to receive death threats on a regular basis. She is a lightning rod for conservative criticism, uh, given her views, her beliefs on Israel and on other topics. The nine-year-old me would be disappointed if I didn't talk about the victims of conflict. And it does raise questions about how far we're going here. Uh, Congress has this power, the majority party has this power when it comes to, uh, to, to committees. Typically, the minority party gets to choose its own members that serve on committees, but there are ways to get around that, as we saw recently with, the, with Speaker McCarthy's efforts to remove two Democrats from the Intelligence Committee. This is, though, even another step, because this mm. then took it to the House floor, aired those statements, th that history, uh, in very public fashion, and, and took a, a, a dramatic step against uh, against a woman who's got a lot of friends on the left, a lot of friends inside that Congress, and a lot of people watching this moment. Rick, when you describe the outrage over anti-Semitism, if that's a thing, Marjorie Taylor Greene made anti-Semitic comments. She apologized, then she made more anti-Semitic comments. And the moment Republicans were able to draw up committees this year, guess what? They put her on the Homeland Security Committee. Same with Paul Gosar. So if it's not just about the anti-Semitism, if it's more about the retribution. Does this signal what the next couple of years are going to look like in Congress? It's not like they're going to be able to pass a bunch of laws. That This is the stuff they can do. Yeah, look, in the absence of, of actual governing, which is going to be difficult these times, uh, what you can do is the other thing, which is politics. We want to remove Alejandro Mayorkas from office because he's not serving the American people. This is going to be the new normal in Washington, Brett. I mean, just this week, we saw uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, uh, articles of impeachment uh, filed against him in an effort to, to try to oust him entirely. There were vows of major new investigations of uh, of Hunter Biden over uh, over his laptop, a full investigation of the Biden family. Uh, Merrick Garland's decision as Attorney General are very much under scrutiny. You're seeing this across the board, and, and investigations are one area where the majority party doesn't need the minority party to go Long. It doesn't matter who controls the Senate, who controls the White House, if you control the gavels in one of the chambers of Congress. Yeah, and just like a presidential impeachment, uh, uh, an impeachment of a federal officer requires the Senate. You might not have Democrats sign on to this, but you don't need the Senate when you're talking about which House members you can kind of throw off these committees. So a huge moment here to sort of start this Congress. Uh, Rick Klein, thanks so much. Hey, thank you, Brad. Next up on Start Here, they're not just scaring kids, they're snatching them up. The stolen orphans of Ukraine after the break. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The war in Ukraine isn't just about land, it's about identity. From the early days of this war, both sides were clear that, in addition to NATO, this all hinged on the concept of being Ukrainian. For decades, Ukrainians have fostered a very clear national identity, distinct from the old Soviet Union. When Vladimir Putin announced his invasion, though, much of his argument was on historic grounds. You're part of us, and you always will be. Russia holding so-called referendums now in parts of eastern Ukraine. Moscow has now started fast-tracking Russian passports for Ukrainians in areas that they occupy. The goal was not just to occupy them, it was to make people there understand they are Russian once again, in their language, in their street signs, in their school textbooks. And what better way to russify a country than through its children? Throughout this war, more and more parents have faced a very specific nightmare in which their Ukrainian children are taken and turned Russian. ABC's foreign correspondent Inez de la Quattara has been reporting on all this. And Inez, you had parents here and people that run orphanages essentially saying that the, the, the nation's children have been stolen. That's right, Brad. Yeah, some even saying the kids were kidnapped. So we actually met uh, 15 orphans who were in the Mykolaiv region. And when the war broke out, the head of the orphanage, Natalia, told us she and the kids packed up as soon as the war broke out. They waited to be evacuated, only to find out no one was coming for them. The kids moved into the basement below their school, and the region quickly fell, and Russian soldiers soon came to the orphanage. I remember this tank very well that stopped and began to twist around its nozzle. We froze in horror. I thought it would shoot our school. The head of the orphanage, Natalia, told us they felt they were under constant surveillance, different Russian soldiers uh, coming to the orphanage every day. I didn't believe that the horror would last for so long. I thought everything would end soon. She says that the soldiers treated the children well, that they did bring them food and gifts and, and that type of thing, but that they barred them from leaving and that they were furious to learn that she had been asking around for help. They were armed and angry. One of them was hitting a table with his hands and the floor with a rifle. He tried to scare me. He said, do you even realize what you were doing and how it could end? They then uh, were told that they would be brought to the Kherson region. Uh, Natalia explained how the children were uh, loaded up in uh, military vehicles, that uh, Russian soldiers escorted them. Uh, she says the children were also used for propaganda. They secured the orphanage the whole night. They counted children in the shelter. They checked if I was hiding somebody. They were patrolling, walking between rooms. And then the story continues with them being brought to Russia with, without them even knowing where they were going. Why, Inez, is there a sense as to why these, like, why kids are being taken like this and why orphans would be like, essentially rounded up and then taken back to, to the homeland? So according to, you know, Ukrainian officials, they've been saying close to 14,000 children have been taken since the war began. The idea is that this is uh, to put these kids up for adoption, uh, for Russian families to be able to adopt them. We know uh, Russian President Putin has fast-tracked the process for uh, Russian parents to be able to adopt Ukrainian children. And, um, you know, this does constitute a war crime. And, and in some cases, uh, the forcible of transfer of, of children can even qualify as genocide. So certainly very mm. um, alarming. But we have seen propaganda video aired in Russia of these, you know, children, Ukrainian orphans um, coming off of trains and then just being handed out to Russian parents on, on the train station. Was your daughter kidnapped by Russian soldiers? I would say yes. One of these kids actually already had a family. So uh, Yulia had already been adopted by an American family. All her paperwork was, uh, you know, finalized. It was finalized four days after the war broke out. You know, literally the only thing left was to get her visa and get her on a plane and bring her home. Like, that's all we had. 
left to do for her. We met her mother, Beth White, who is in Wyoming, um, who talked about how terrified she, she'd been these last nine months looking for her daughter. And so, like, I was really preparing for the worst of, like, this is over. <laughs> you know, we're never going to see her again. You know, it's like, how, if these parents can't do anything, if you're sitting there, like, being told, like, oh, they're being taken to Russia, what happens? Like, how do you possibly get these kids back? So in this case, uh, Beth told us she, you know, really started reaching out to as many people as possible. And she did uh, reach out to some volunteers. She totally knew that her child was the only chance these other children had. This and one woman, Ash, who she actually knew from, from church from years ago, and uh, through Ash met another volunteer, uh, Kathy Stickle, who had both been working in Ukraine as volunteers to help evacuate people. I couldn't, I just couldn't stand to have them be thinking that they didn't matter and they were just like leaves that, that are being blown around with no direction and no destination to say, we know we're getting you out, we know it. And so these volunteers just got to work and slowly were able to work their contact to, to figure out where the kids were. We can't actually go into the mechanics of how it was done because it needs done again and again and again. But they, they were able to finally get the kids out of Russia and, and get the kids to cross over into Georgia. Right, we're talking about the country of Georgia. What happens to these children now? So the children are now in Georgia. Uh, we met all 15 of them. <laughs> They are, you know, smiling and, and happy and playing games and, and taking art lessons and learning English and uh, mm. just being kids again. Her room's set up. We've got clothes that were donated for her, or picked out for her specifically. And as for Yulia, we uh, heard from her mother, Beth, that they had flown to Wyoming uh, just this week. She became a U.S. citizen the moment she set foot on U.S. soil. And when we asked her, when we met her in Georgia, we asked her what she's most excited about when it comes to her new life. She just said, peace. Incredible story there, both of the resilience of the children and the fact that these prospective parents basically had to find a rescue crew, like this volunteer rescue crew to help their children, to help their child and the rest of these orphans get back across the Russian border. Uh, Inez de la Quatara, great reporting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one more quick break. When we come back, it was a Groundhog Day catastrophe. Wait, we haven't covered this before? I swear, it just feels like... Anyway, one last thing is next. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. Come on, y'all, make some noise. Ah! I'm Turk Janine. Janine. Gregory. Um, Ava. Ava's here. Sorry, I don't speak line. Reporting from the border of Texas and Mexico, I'm Mireya Villarreal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
And one last thing. Yesterday, of course, was Groundhog Day, that day where we learn from a rodent what season we are currently living in. But not all groundhogs agree with each other. Yesterday in Pennsylvania, Punxsutawney Phil saw his shadow, went back into his burrow, and sentenced residents there to six more weeks of winter. But Staten Island's Chuck here in New York City says we got an early spring. So does Wharton Willie in Ontario, Canada. Apparently the Canadians play this bizarre game too, which is why it was a province-wide emergency in Quebec when the chief groundhog meteorologist there, Fred Lamarmotte, was found dead overnight on Groundhog Eve just hours before his big announcement. Uh, je vous annonce la mort de Fred. According to the organizer that found him, Fred had passed away as he hibernated. It was extra sad because this was the first big outdoor gathering for Fred since the beginning of the pandemic. He'd worked from home each of the last two years. And this created a conundrum in the moment. I mean, there's no official line of succession for some of these groundhogs. Now on this February 2nd, Punxsutawney Phil, the seer of seers, was awakened from his wintry nap at dawn. In Pennsylvania, Punxsutawney Phil's handlers maintain there's only been one groundhog helping them predict the weather since 1886. Groundhogs, for the record, live an average of six years. Staten Island Chuck, formerly named Charles G. Hogg, famously died in 2014, shortly after being dropped by Mayor Bill de Blasio. Chuck's daughter filled in for him next year. De Blasio never came back. But at the last minute, without a groundhog, where do you turn for shadow spotting? How do you even know what season we're in? Well, back in Quebec, they decided to go on with festivities, figuring it's what Fred La Marmotte would have wanted. They dressed some kids up in groundhog costumes and asked those kids if they saw their shadows. Et le printemps sera tardif. Here's the kicker. The children on a bright sunny day near the Quebecois coastline, of course, saw their shadows, which means it's still winter there, and by next year, everyone's hoping Fred's son, Fred Jr., will be ready. How hard do you think those parents were, like, leaning on their kids? You don't see your shadow. Yes, I do, Papa. I do see my shadow. No, you don't. This is why you're an amateur groundhog. Start Here is produced by Kelly Therese, Jen Newman, Brenda Salinas Baker, Madeline Wood, Vika Aronson, Iru Ekpanobi, Cameron Chertavian, and Tara Gimbel. Ariel Chester is our social media producer. Josh Cohan is director of podcast programming. I'm our managing editor. Laura Mayer is our executive producer. Thanks to Lakia Brown, John Newman, and Liz Alessi. Special thanks this week to Chris Berry, Mara Milwaukee, our partners at Canadian Television, CTV, and Anthony Ali. I'm Brad Milkey. See you next week. on the line.